point, the research interests in my work, I would talk about this idea of the space between. So I, when I say that, I mean between two and three dimensionality. Um, I'm also interested in um, the concept of facades or the internal or external life of objects or wall-based works. I use a lot of immersive um, color and uh, immersive scale, and I'm interested in the history of color field painting. And then in general, I'm looking towards explorations and process, materiality, form, and scale. And just as a practicing artist, I have a lot of different trajectories. So I have my studio practice, I do commissions, collaborations, curate exhibitions, and um, I also am a, a professor. Okay. So just going back to my early work, um, I actually started as a humanities major at Carnegie Mellon University. And I started thinking that I was going to be an English major um, and then I eventually transferred back home to Ohio State. Um, I grew up in Westerville, Ohio, um, and took some fine art courses there. And then finally, I transferred to the School Art Institute of Chicago to finish my undergrad. Um, I, I was focused in print media. Um, and in that time, I, I found that I was more interested in the process rather than kind of the, the imagery that I was making. Um, and then I returned to SAIC for my MFA in the Fiber and Material Studies Department. And then just looking at the work from my, um, the two main graduate school advisors I had, the really inspirational practicing artists, um, Ann Wilson, who in, kind of um, introduced this concept of two and a half D, the space between two and three dimensionality to me. Also, I was working with Peter Power in the print department. Another thing to think about in terms of kind of the inspiration behind my work and going to the Art Institute is the, um, the proximity and accessibility to the museum's collection. And I would pass through the museum quite often um, in between classes or for classes. And these three pieces in particular, um, I feel like were very influential in terms of thinking about working in between the wall and the floor space working as a formalist, um, also abstractions of landscape and scale. And when I was looking up this Georgia O'Keeffe painting that is from later in her career, I liked how um, she mentions that it, the, the size was ridiculous, but she had it in her head as something she wanted to do for a couple of years. And I, I think of that in terms of the piece that I'm sitting in front of right now that I'll talk about later, but just really wanting to create a, an immersive scale within my work. Other examples of artists that I'm drawn to would be Louise Bourgeois and especially her textile designs and how she uses um, design and imagery within those. Um, also E.E. E. Cummings poetry and how they become these sculptural poems and how he uses text sculpturally in his writing. And Polly Applebaum um, dyeing and painting fabrics, um, specifically velvet that she'll cut out and then lay across um, a floor, but they become very sculptural or kind of, again, that two and a half D space. These are pretty early pieces, um, but I see them relating to what I'm doing now in terms of abstractions of landscape, um, some sort of interactivity that could happen, and my entry into thinking sculpturally through pliable, malleable materials, so paper, fabric, wood. Um, this piece in particular is something that could um, kind of fold back into its container and then be unfurled out. Also as reference points, I was in grad school, I was looking at um, the uncontrollability of nature as a starting point to then transfer or translate into objects. So this was a, a drawn version of the last slide um, onto vinyl and then stapled on the wall. And then I just kind of gesturally stuffed fabric into the, the vinyl so that it was swelling off the wall, similar to an eruption or kind of that, that starting image. Um, I got to a point in graduate school though, where I felt like I was kind of starting to pigeonhole myself into using um, specific found imagery. So I got to a point where I wanted to kind of empty out my practice and just start with materiality so, and, and formal concerns. Um, so I started collaging, just quick collages of fabric. And then um, those collages I would replicate in wood. So I entitled it the duplicate series. Um, also during that time, my advisor Ann Wilson recommended that I paint my studio floor white so that the space became like I was um, working within a painting um, within a canvas. 
Um, so here's some examples from that series. And I felt like it really um, allowed me to be playful in my work and gestural and relate to quilting and patchworking um, and defining my work in my own terms and, and learning how to become an abstract artist. Here's some other examples. And then that kind of moved me into thinking of maybe then revisiting the idea of the landscape, but how can I abstract it through my own lived experience and um, through drawn lines or sculpted lines in the studio space. Oftentimes in my work, um, and I think it relates back to my interest in writing, I'll start with um, the title first. So for this piece, I started with the idea or concept of isthmus, which is a, a body of land that connects two larger bodies of land together. So starting with just the word as a, a point to generate a piece of art and also layering, um, starting to layer fabric so that the two dimensional quality started to accumulate into a three dimensional whole. Um, here's some other examples of that working style. And again, referencing landscape and also trying to fi find a way to create objects that seem to still have some movement, um, that they weren't static, that they had um, activity about them. So really during this time, um, just playing with felt a lot. I, I was interested in felt because it has like kind of a thick um, uh, uh, striation to it. So I can layer it and get some really nice um, um, accumulation of, of layers to it. The other thing that's been pretty influential in my work is, uh, has been the opportunity to do artist residencies. And my first residency was at Central Michigan University in 2007. And I was um, the visiting artist for the art department there. The program um, gives you a, a studio in a remote setting that's about 20 miles away from campus. And so I had to teach two classes and then make a new body of work. And since I had been living in Chicago and then coming to this rural location, um, I could see how the landscape was starting to impact my work. And this was one of the first, actually this is the first um, machine sewn collage that I made. And I think it's kind of a conflation between watching, I live by a river in Michigan, so kind of watching the currents, but also thinking back to the brickwork that I would see often in Chicago. Um, and it's working with small strips and I was thinking about like how to create the striations um, in wall pieces that I was creating in my sculptural works. Another body of work that was coming out um, that I was starting at the around the same time um, were these paper pieces that I still make today. And those were inspired by being in Chicago and observing paint peeling at the L stops, uh, the train stops, and that they would try to paint over them and then they, the, the layers of billboards and paint would just chip away. So those little kind of spots of color that I was perceiving as I was taking the train to school. So I was trying to figure out a way to emulate that. But again, without photographing them or replicating them, but, but inventing a process that echoed um, the, what I was perceiving. Um, and oftentimes in my work, then I'll kind of come up with a process that I'm interested in and then kind of have like, what if I apply that process to fabric? So with those paper pieces, um, I, I went back to fabric and was screen printing open fields of color. So basically painting open fields of color and squeegeeing them over the surface of fabric and then layering then cutting back into them. Um, and then I made a series of smaller sculptures that were comprised of the remnants from that previous piece. So that points to the fact that I'm quite often saving a lot of my remnants. I very rarely throw things away. Um, I keep just kind of bags of um, leftover material and then find ways to generate them into new works in my practice. And then th th this is just an example of how I can construct these layered um, fabric sculptures. So there's a foam armature and then I work in small sections that I'm gluing repeatedly over and over. And um, sometimes I have a general idea of what they'll end up looking like, but oftentimes it's just um, following the accumulation and letting them grow organically. Um, so then I, I had gone back to Chicago and I think um, because of my time in Michigan, I was really wanting to seek out some more um, 
remote or nature-based residencies. So I went to New Orleans in 2008 for about six weeks um, through a studio in the woods. And they wanted artists to respond um, visually to post-Katrina New Orleans. And this was a, a piece that I proposed to them. It was very uh, um, uh, ephemeral and not permanent whatsoever. It was um, coating mylar onto plywood and then just configuring it out in the in the field near the house. But I wanted to, to read like broken terrain or broken mirror and that was reflecting the, the forest into the piece. And I was a still, I was still working on um, sewn fabric pieces at that time and um, being influenced by the color and the horizon along the, the river near the residency. And also finding ways to do quick sketches out of fabric. Um, and again, how can I reuse my remnants, the cutaway debris, and then give new life to them as, as a kind of fabric sketch. And from those small processes, I, I made this piece, which I've done a few like this, but it's kind of a standalone piece in, the body, in my body of work where um, for about two years, I worked on it on and off very slowly, but it's all these compiled bits and fragments that I sewed onto a backing fabric and then just it grew and grew and grew. And I, I feel like with this piece, it just, it was like never enough kind of needed to be bigger. So um, it's probably one of the largest pieces I had done up until that point. And then right around the same time, I did one of my first textile commissions kind of based off of that um, original piece, but I had an art consultant who was interested in seeing if I could make larger scale pieces for a lobby space in New Jersey. Um, so here are the pieces installed. And I showed that um, image a couple of slides ago of the fact that I do a lot of drawing um, in my sketchbook as preliminary ideas for, for a lot of the pieces that I create. The next few images are then um, more sculptural pieces where I'm again layering felt and um, fleece to think about that internal life of the object and kind of citing the, the pedestal as this neutral gallery object, but also reading it as um, kind of a, a personification or um, uh, bringing out the human quality of an object and thinking about the internal life. And also having a little bit of humor or kind of unexpected burst of color in my work. Um, and then this is another piece where I'm just slowly layering fabric um, in, in circle sequences. And again, thinking about the titling and how it, it also reads as kind of like an um, anthropomorphic or body form as it's slumping and leaning on, on the ground. So here's some other examples of, again, accumulation of layers and wanting to create sculptures that feel like they still have uh, movement or energy or they're still in a kind of transitory state. Uh, here's other sketches for um, a sculpture I wanted to make. So again, oftentimes my ideas start with drawings. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to make the piece or how it will manifest, but I keep a pretty active sketchbook. Um, and here's some detail shots at the time I was still living in Chicago and my daughter was six months old um, and just showing how I lived above a restaurant. And so I would go down, I actually worked at that restaurant too for a while, um, but I would work during the day when the courtyard was closed, um, getting the armature of this piece put together and then also working on the fabric portion of it um, at the same time. So then joining those two pieces together and here, the, here it is installed with one of my um, textile pieces in the background at McCormick Gallery in Chicago. Um, I just show this as kind of like a process image of how oftentimes I'll use wood armatures on the back of my work to um, allow the pieces to float off of the wall. And again, through my process of sewing sections of uh, fabric together, they become really tactile and sculptural. And then I also have done a series where I thought of, again, taking my process that I was working with, with um, accumulation sewing and using that as a skin to cover armatures and objects. Some other um, opportunities I've had, and in my work, again, I'm always looking for new ways to kind of push and stretch the scope of my work. So um, I was commissioned to do a um, geocaching site for the Dublin Arts Council um, so there's a container or a box element inside of it. And I wanted to feel like an abstraction of slate, the slate deposits. 
Um, and then more recently this year, they had me do kind of a, a sequel to that piece, that original piece and create something that was in response to it. So I went back to the site and filled in these negative spaces in between rocks around the original piece. It's kind of like a scavenger, visual scavenger hunt. Uh, this is another piece that was temporary at the Franklin Park Conservatory that was curated into a show. But again, like I, I'm always looking at how can I translate my work into different materials um, and, and see kind of what, what comes out of that and working abstractly. This project was through uh, Rooms to Let, which was a project by Melissa Bogley Woods. And so it invites artists to um, um, go into houses that are going to be demolished and do installations and, and visual interventions in the space. So the theme, I went to do the site visit and I saw all these existing holes in the wall. And so I was thinking about how can I kind of emulate this, maybe there's like a internal life of this house that I can show through um, sculptural placements and filling in those, those voids. And then back to my paperwork. So, um, I, I have worked kind of from micro versions of those, which is shown here, and then um, macro versions. I have a little time lapse of my process here. So basically, I'll start with, um, again, open screen printing paper, randomly placing colors, and then eventually uh, what I'll do is I'll glue the perimeter of the paper, um, and then I'll tear into it. I'll cut it with an X-Acto knife and then I tear into it to create these cavities and kind of forgetting where I'm placing the color um, so that there's these um, happy accidents of where the colors are coming together. You kind of see the gluing process. And then maybe the tearing process. So in my practice, I'm, I'm working additively and, su and subtractively. And I like that push and pull that I, again, I'm going two and a half D um, in between 2D and 3D. Okay. Uh, this was a collaboration then that was based off of my paper pieces with uh, Jeff Hayes from OSU. He's a professor of interior design and it was an opportunity put forth by us to collaborate through uh, at the OSU Urban Art Space. So what we landed on through collaboration was making a macro version of my paper pieces where we created these um, paper mache panels, 16 panels, they're nine by nine feet. And we painted one side, the bottom side of them white, and then the other side's very saturated color. And we tore um, cavities into those layers. And then through collaborative back and forth, we decided to place um, mirror paneling below so that then this, um, cavity was reflected into the floor. I have to say it's one of my pieces that I've worked on where it, it just is so much better in person to have that experience. And then we reinstalled it at Hammond Harkins for an exhibition in 2015. And we had always wanted to see it um, in a different orientation and see how the lights changed throughout the day. So again, that reflective color of daylight to the nighttime in the gallery. I have some images of residencies that I've done. So one in particular, uh, in 2015, I went to Latvia for a textile symposium. And again, I find that residencies are a really great way to challenge my work and um, come up with new inspiration in, unex in unexpected ways or just um, studying different landscapes. So there are about 10 of us and I, it was in November and I kind of put the screenshot of the weather because it's like being from Ohio and thinking that this that's really gray here, it's like that much grayer and um, darker there, but, uh, and all the walls were painted dark at the residency and there weren't really any walls to put my work on, but I did end up doing quick um, studies, <clears throat> small scale works. And then this is actually one of the pieces in the show here and just showing that like, I was able to put this one on the wall, but uh, another piece that I was working on, I just had to work on the floor, which I end up doing a lot anyways. Uh, this residency was through the textile um, center in New York City and it is a work in progress. So they invite artists to set up their studio and their storefront and work um, as much as they want to over the course of a month. And then also take, oh, uh, I'm sorry, teach a workshop there. 
And then um, I went to Mass Mocha to do studios at Mass Mocha residency. And again, just showing the, the process of the pieces I was working on while I was there. So oftentimes my, my work is starting in the sketchbook and then um, growing from there, different ideas and compositions. These were <clears throat> probably the first couple of pieces that where I was um, wanting to use dyed fabric. And that's something that's been um, going on in my work more recently as well. So it seems like in the body of my work too, I'll make some smaller scale pieces and then it, it usually want, it makes me want to make larger scale pieces and investigate those processes further. The next few images are of commissions that I've done recently for the Dayton Library System. Um, they have a really nice partnership with the Dayton Art Institute. So they'll have um, a couple pieces from their collection where they'll want artists to respond to those in, in some sort of way. And so one of the pieces that for the main branch was um, Monet Water Lilies, one of his pieces. So I made a series of these six kind of cloud lily pad forms that I installed. And then a year later, a year or so later, um, they had another call and this was uh, inspired by a Georgia O'Keeffe painting that was in their collection. So I like these, um, these commissions because it's not necessarily something that I will do in my kind of regular body of work, but it does expand the scope of my work. Um, and then this is another piece that I did recently where I was commissioned to, well, I had proposed to do these, this big, strange sculptural forms. And I have to say that in my practice now, I lean more towards wall-based pieces um, because just of kind of the demand from galleries and exhibitions, but also just like the practicality of storing things and funding for large scale sculptures. So when I get an opportunity to do something, this was for a storefront in Akron, um, it's really fun to, again, go back in my sketches and think about these forms that I'm inventing and get the opportunity to make them come to life. Um, but I'd like to show that, you know, again, I'm like working in my garage and, um, and then this is the final piece. So it's really like, I have home studio space, um, but I go to residencies and I just kind of work, work at the kitchen table, wherever, wherever it's happening. Um, so I went to Dresden through the Greater Columbus Arts Council exchange program in 2018. And right before I was going, I was contacted by the um, curatorial program at Facebook to do a commission <clears throat> for their Chicago offices. Um, so during that residence, this is a rendering for it. During that residency, then I was very focused on completing this immersive installation. I have this as an example of just the patterning again, like observing and, and noticing the things that are inspiring me when I travel or go to residencies. Um, so I was simultaneously doing kind of small sketches in the morning, but knowing that when I was going to the studio, I was working on this large scale installation that I um, created in parts that I didn't have the final composition totally figured out when I was in Dresden, but just trying to generate enough sections so that when I went to do the installation, I would have enough. There's a cat that was walking through the studio one day. Um, and then this is like one of my favorite things I got from the flea market in Dresden, which was like 10 euros for this huge box of thread. Um, so this is just how kind of showing the process of how I incrementally build installations and um, trying to generate enough material. But then once I go to install, it is kind of intuitive on the spot work that I'm doing. And you can kind of see in the left <coughs> image that part of my process is just repeatedly cutting strips of fabric and the fabrics are coming from fabric stores or donations or some of this fabric I brought from the US and some of it I bought while I was there or I was going to the flea market to get fabric. So it's kind of non-hierarchical fabrics, any and all fabrics, um, all are fair game in my practice. Um, my daughter came with us to the on the residency and she was eight at the time so I like this image of I'm um, trying to keep her occupied in the studio and having her kind of sending her around to do some little still lives of her observations and she actually ended up selling the mannequin painting to someone who came to an open studio um, and then just showing the residency of, of kind of again that work life or trying to have a work-life balance of 
working really hard on a project, but then also doing some family kid based activities while we were there. I lost my, here we go. While we were in Dresden, I made a connection with the a textile museum that's about an hour west of Dresden. And so it, they still have um, all these functioning looms and sewing machines, but they also have an exhibition space. So through this connection, I was invited to have a show there um, actually this past February, which I have images of and I'll talk about in a little bit. So then um, once I got back from Dresden, I and um, also with textile pieces in terms of traveling internationally, what's nice is that I can fold them all up into a suitcase, hopefully that they'll all fit. And I've gotten really good at weighing my luggage to make sure I'm not maxing out the weight or paying extra. Um, but so then bringing them to Chicago and installing them. Um, and this was the first time that I stapled the pieces directly into the wall. So it created a really tight skin against and kind of embedding the, the pieces into the wall. And then these are pieces that I, I was making after that residency. So again, you can kind of see how the ripple effect of going and um, perceiving patterning or how my work kind of will continually influence the next piece and the next piece. So these pieces were more, I didn't do sketches of them. They were more kind of intuitive, just accumulations that I was um, creating. These pieces um, kind of call back to my duplicate series where I created a rectangular um, gradient and then cut a large circle out of that. So creating these, this kind of um, diptych from the original one. And then this is the piece that I did for the Columbus Museum of Art. Um, since I went to Dresden, they'll invite the, the people who travel to Dresden and the fellowship winners each year to have an exhibition at the museum. Um, and so I actually see if I can do this really quick. I have a time lapse of installing just so you can kind of see the process. So again, I'm not, I have a general composition in mind, but then when I get to the site, I'm pinning things up first and then I'll slowly start stapling them down. It's a lot of kind of going up on the ladder and then stepping back and then adjusting or cutting things away. Um, and again, just working intuitively. So near the end of this, you can kind of see how maybe go back and kind of flatten it all down with the staples. So again, it, be, it becomes like a, a skin on the wall. And then used a pneumatic stapler, which ended up being a little bit of overkill. <laughs> and so I had to apologize for um, all the patching they had to do, but they were, they were very kind about that. So let me get back to my presentation here. Um, in 2019, because I had gone to Dresden and I really enjoyed my experience, I had been looking to go back um, specifically to Berlin and do a residency there and also build a body of work so that I could um, leave it there for the show I was going to have in Hohenstein Ernsthal in February 2020. Um, so during that time, I was thinking a lot about the Bauhaus textile artists and their use of patterning and color but also perceiving all the graffiti that was around um, my just kind of walks that I would take daily. So I, the resulting pieces I, I felt like were kind of um, facades of buildings that had some kind of graffiti abstraction to them, some visual movement. When I came back from Berlin, I was commissioned to do a project for the Moxie Hotel in Columbus. And this was based off of something similar that I'd done a few years back. Um, with this dyed carpet nylon, or I dyed the nylon fibers I had um, amassed from a different project and they're woven into uh, a steel wire mesh and then installed on the wall. The next few images are just showing references of how, again, I, I have a really active sketchbook practice and I, I like that as a catalog of ideas that I might not necessarily get to for a year or so just keeping that as a collection of thoughts. Um, so this is um, the first version of the piece that's in, in the show now, but just to kind of see how they start and then they're executed. 
Um, so the show that I had last February in, um, in the Eastern area of Germany, um, we set up a material exchange or specifically the curator was sending me materials that were produced in the region, um, utilitarian materials like so for firefighters. Um, and there's also a jacquard weavings that are produced um, at the actual museum. So she was sending me, me these to patchwork into pieces to then create an installation. There was a large wall in the gallery space that was about 11 by 30 feet. And so at, to the point of the utilitarian materials, I began thinking about like, well, what would I use as the symbol for a utilitarian material? And so I looked to denim and further research, um, I found that denim was a really big symbol in the revolution that was happening during the fall of the Berlin Wall, which had had its um, 30th anniversary last fall. So it all was kind of lining up conceptually and um, interesting as a material to use for the exhibition in Germany. So I brought some de denim from the US and then the community donated about 50 pairs of jeans that I cut up on site. And I was there working for about a week. Um, so I used all the, the legs of the denim to create a patchwork wall. And then I put um, some sewn patchworking over top of it to read like graffiti or clouds. So there's again, this kind of confusion between is it a landscape or an urban wall or both. Um, I also made two large scale circle pieces while I was there for the exhibition. So it was really great to be able to work on site in the museum um, while I was there. And here's some more images of the, the wall. The, 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 these are process images of the piece that I'm sitting in front of um, that I made last fall before going to Germany that was uh, intended for a show I was having in Dallas in March. Um, so I just like to show the fact that I, again, work very incrementally that I work in small sections that I sew together and then they slowly build into fields of color. Um, and in particular, my studio space is at home. And so because I was trying to make like an eight by 22 foot piece, but I didn't have that continuous of a wall just showing how I had to kind of improvise by, by using two walls and, and rounding the corner with the piece. And that oftentimes I'm working on the floor and especially for this piece, I built it in two sections, <laughs> so I had to hand sew the, the middle portion together to join the two. And then here are some install shots from that exhibition and the um, museum director's daughter on the floor. And I, I love that for the sense of scale and also just how the, the color is reflecting in, in the floor of the space. And we'll look at this one closer in a little bit. Um, here's some installation shots from that show. So was, again, it was a two-person show with Galen Cheney. She's a painter um, who lives in North Adams, Massachusetts. Um, but just again, showing textile pieces and paper pieces represented in the show. Um, the the teeter-totter piece is here at the Rafe's uh, Gallery. And then Prism is another piece. These two were made from portions of the zigzag installation at, from the Columbus Museum. So I ended up taking that apart and reusing it in different pieces. <laughs> um, the next few images are from getting back after um, traveling to Dallas and um, the shutdown occurred, um, being at home and looking around and wanting to be able to work while my daughter was homeschooling and, and just working at the kitchen table and doing some quicker collage, paper collage based things. So these are strips of paper left over from my torn pieces that I um, was cutting into rectangles. And again, some sketches from the time. Um, I had been drawing this idea of kind of a large scale uh, raindrop or teardrop or both. And so that's something that I made out of, again, remnants from that installation from the Columbus Museum. And then also during this time, um, doing some more like hand stitching and embroidery and creating appliques to attach onto surfaces. So here's a detail of that. Um, these are some pieces that I've made from all the other remnants that I have from my denim projects. Um, so the, the image on the left are all the seams or kind of the hems from the bottom of the legs. And then the image on the right uh, had all these kind of strange rect um, triangular pieces left over that I collaged onto a canvas. Um, and then just further examples of again, sketches. I think I drew this a year before I actually made this piece. 
and more recent pieces of drawing onto fabric and then using the drawn material to collage into, into the sewn pieces. Uh, I like to show, this is a recent piece, like sometimes I'll have an idea and then as I'm working on it, it, it changes. But this was an idea to make something that was going to be more sculptural coming off the wall. And then I ended up, as I was sewing it and finishing it, I decided to kind of just stretch it and flatten it back down. So it's that push and pull that I have in my materials and imagery. And then lastly, uh, this is a, the most recent project. So I had about 150 pockets left over from all the jeans. And I've been thinking about like a way to make it an interactive installation, not knowing when or where I was going to do that. Um, and over the summer, thinking about um, some of the protests that had gone on around Hammond Harkins galleries in the short north and seeing some video and um, wanting to create something that was going to bring positivity or a sense of a communal voice back to that um, area. So I proposed to them that I would create this installation of all the pockets and it's called Heart on Your Sleeve. And it is asking the public to donate small works of art or writing or ephemera to create a community time capsule and a reaction to our, our current state. Um, so this is just me showing like how <laughs> the project would work. Um, and so the last leg of this will be me documenting all the objects and art that have been donated and then creating a virtual exhibition of, of all that documentation. Um, so here's my website and Instagram. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I have for my presentation. Um, so I can show up. Go. Did I do it? <laughs> Good. Okay. Again, if we want to look at things closer here at the gallery, um, I would just draw attention to um, how I do repetitions of sewing over my surfaces to take these collage materials and flatten them into a surface. Um, also that I have some kind of um, quick dyeing that I do of the fabric. So you can kind of see that there's some imperfection to the, the consistency of the dye, but I like that as kind of like an atmospheric effect on the fabric. Um, and then just looking closely at all the different types of materials. So there's vinyls, there's, I like this, it's like a faux denim print. Um, there's painted fabrics. There's just a lot of different things from people giving me fabrics or fabrics that I've bought, um, collaging together. And again, that using a lot of different um, thread colors to create like a drawn, line drawn surface for my pieces. And then you can talk about this one in person. This piece, so I talked about this um, being from lot when I went to Latvia and actually I, when I put this up, when I was installing here, I realized that this is probably the first piece that I was using some denim remnants um as as a material but i like this piece because um there's i like the positive and negative space and i like the idea that this becomes very fragile and it has a really nice shadow quality to it so that there's some, some density but then some um, kind of lightweight materiality that's happening at the bottom and also maybe one of the first times i was using uh, circles as a um, repeated motif as a pattern And this is the large scale piece. I can, one thing that's kind of nice to see, and I know people who sew, and this is like just seeing, there's a lot of kind of accidents in terms of wet, when I'm sewing and the, the bobbin maybe not working out, but I'm really more interested in a quick gestural approach. So I'll use a backing fabric. And then basically what I'm doing is just laying strips of fabric down and then just sewing them repeatedly and you can kind of see where those panels come together. And through that process, what I really love is that it becomes like 
pretty tactile and, and has some body to it as I manhandle my work. <laughs> Artists always do, I think. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's malleable. So you can, you could really play around with like how the folds are, are hanging on the wall, but I like that kind of improv improvisation about it. And that then, because I used a canvas backing, there's this fraying that is coming through from the panels. And so that starts reading like kind of like frayed cups on a pair of jeans, which was not something I was intending. And then when I started using the canvas, I really liked that effect. And in this piece, um, I think of it as an immersive landscape, or it could be water or sky, um, or just kind of representational of movement, a kind of abstraction of, of physical movement through a space. And so these kind of little bits of color showing that movement may be diffusing across the surface. And I think, so again, going back to the scale of it, because I had the opportunity to show in a pretty large gallery space with continuous walls, it was a challenge, an opportunity to make something really immersive, large scale, going back to that idea of um, color field paintings where your peripheral vision is just saturated with um, color and patterning. And that denim also represents, you know, it's a very specific material that we all have a, pretty much everyone has a relationship with in some way or another. So um, it's another way to embed the viewer and think about how the audience can really see themselves in, in the work through the material choice. And lastly, So I think with working on this piece and I had remnants from that installation, it was more about um, working intuitively to, I knew I wanted to do a rectangular format, but I wasn't quite sure how the composition would turn out. And so what ended up happening is as I was working on it, oftentimes too, I'll, I'll cut back into pieces. So there's this definite line that I created down the middle by cutting and then re-sewing it together. And oftentimes that, that can also cause some kind of surface structure to happen with it. I don't know, this one, sometimes the backs are kind of crazy, but this one, just different materials I'm using as a backer, but you can kind of also see like how I'm layering this as well. And this is nice too, because this was original, like a note to myself for that original installation. And then it just gets um, put into this piece. Sure. All right. We had um, a comment from Mickey that said, wonderful talk. Um, and they really enjoyed it. That was pretty much it. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> it's always hard because it, because it is condensing about 15 years of work and not wanting to go too quick, but also not wanting to stay too long. So. <laughs> So I have a question about, um, it's the first time I've heard anyone say two and a half. Yeah. 
Um, and I think that's really smart. Um, I've been familiar with your work for a while, and what I would love to hear you talk more about is how you have found your way into the design of um, space, mm. like how you are using color and form to uh, manipulate a viewer's eye. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how um, how you were inspired to come to that place and uh, how you think about it as you interact with more two-dimensional to your two and a half, to your three? Yeah. Well, and I think in that question, it makes me think about my relationship to installation works. So that, um, you know, earlier on, I was making more sculptures and wanting to create pieces that were these impacts of color within the gallery space to draw the viewer in. And I think through that process of making sculptures that made me like hungrier in a way that I wanted to see and through opportunities, I wanted to see like, not just draw the viewer in to look at an object, but like in encapsulate and immerse the viewer. So, um, but yeah, I think it's just, thinking about my ideas first and then what modality is, is most fitting. Is it a sculpture? Is it a wall-based piece? Is it an installation? And having space in my practice for anything to happen and, and follow those leads that um, through the opportunities are just the ideas. Does that makes is that helpful? But yeah, two and a half D, that was Ann Wilson, my advisor, when she, and I have to think that she coined that phrase and it just spoke to me when she told me that in graduate school. I loved, I loved that idea. Yeah. Um, Julia Hamilton said, I love your work, Andrea, congrats. <laughs> and then we have a comment from someone whose uh, name on Zoom is a little bit different, but they said, hi, how, if at all, is COVID impacting your work? And what are you currently most inspired by to make it? Wow. Yeah, COVID definitely impacted my work. Um, you know, as I was, yeah, I just had traveled to Germany and just gotten back from Dallas and I had some opportunities. Like, I mean, this show for one that was delayed or some other things that were um, kind of canceled. Uh, and I think those, those slides that I showed of needing to make no matter what and that as an artist, I use art making as like, like, uh, if I distilled it down, it is a catharsis and a processing of the world. So just letting my practice lead me through kind of the, the emotional roller coaster that we've all been on and the kind of the exhaustion. So I feel like my, my work has still, there's still been opportunities though and, and commissions and things happening. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like at the beginning of of the pandemic, it was definitely like an existential crisis for a lot of us about how are we going to view art now? Um, how are we gonna, um, my husband's a musician, like how, how can we go? We can't go see live music, you know? So how is it impacting the arts? And I think as an artist, no matter what, I just have to keep making my work and use it as a way to process all of this. And it definitely, I feel grateful that I have that as a tool. <laughs> Um, and then what, there was a second part to that question, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think just in terms of my work, whatever I'm making, it's this, it's been a domino effect since I started, I mean, you know, like even in undergrad, but just how each piece leads me to make the next piece that there are threads running through all my pieces that even if I looked back 20 years into undergrad, it might not look like my work now, but I understand how I've gotten where I am with my work. Um, so just paying attention to that and, and always kind of staying like wanting to make more and pushing at the boundaries of what I've already made. We have a question from Suzanne Molo. And she said, uh, you referenced a poet earlier on <laughs> in, your, in your talk. Yes. And another artist who works with 2D and words that went by me too fast. Who are they? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I brought up E.E. E. Cummings. So within his work, um, he he's very playful with um, how he 
does or doesn't capitalize letters or he'll run words together. And I see him working really sculpturally with the, the language. And I love that. And I think through knowing about him, but also my, my um, background as wanting to starting out as wanting to be a creative writer. Um, I think about how can I title things or play around with the structures or kind of pushing words together. Um, so yeah, that, that was the reference. Sue Cavanaugh said, thanks Andrea. It's so great to hear about all your residencies. Love your work and was thrilled to get to see it in person. Thank you. Hi Sue, you're great. <laughs> and then question from Amy. I really appreciate your approach and treatment of the surface in your work. I'm curious about what materials you're experimenting with and how you would describe the relationship of material to surface. So just in general, what materials I'm experimenting with. Um, well, right now it's still kind of been a lot of denim, but I think more recently, um, can, yeah, can I paint and draw on my um, fabric? How can I use dyed fabrics? Uh, how can I cut things out and applique them? So it's, it's always that, again, that, like, I think I described it as a push and pull of, of accumulation and then um, and deconstruction and reconstruction and allowing there to be some playfulness in my studio. And then there was another part to that question, maybe um, I don't remember. You described the relationship of material to surface. Hmm. I don't know how to interpret that question, material to surface. I mean, I see all of my materials as potential for a surface. And yeah, again, it's like, is it gonna be super flat? Does it involve paint or is, does it kind of accumulate more into a sculptural output? Um, so I don't know if that, if that answers it, but. <laughs> So Andrea, I had this um, really strange kind of visualization as you were talking about E.E. E. Cummings and that he's sculpting with words and immediately I saw all of these little fragments as you sculpting with words. Yeah, and I love that. become words in a way. Yeah. Um, thinking about how an enormous piece like the one right behind you mm -hmm. then becomes, you know, in my brain, a book. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. You know, and I was talking to somebody recently, I was doing an interview and it's, it's great having these talks too, because I think artists make connections on the spot just through having dialogue. Um, but I was like, I think that the fluorescence is like a punctuation on the surface. And yeah, so you're right. <laughs> but also I was talking about how, because I work in sections, it becomes like a calendar in a way where Hmm, maybe like, I don't know, like what was my emotive state on this day where I'm placing these colors together and then would I place different colors together on another day? So it is, it is a, a like a, a writing or documentation of, of kind of a day-to-day -day experience through the accumulation of all these different sections that I work on over a course of months. That's great. So Suzanne had another, another note said great references to a creative process that meanders between intentional and intuitive. Mm, thanks. Um, yeah, and I feel like that, you know, and because I teach, I feel like that's a tricky space of, of teaching intentionality, but also allowing space for um, your intuition and developing that trust in yourself as, a, as an artist. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and another comment from my friend, amazing talk, Andrea, lovely work. You are a genius with color and you're a <laughs> kind of person. Um, thank you for sharing your experience with us. And then another comment from Suzanne, thank you for your truly well-conceived presentation and allowing us a glimpse into your world of inspiration. Um, and then another person said, your palette is just what we all need right now. Thank you for spreading joy in a difficult time. And that's from Jack Sterling. Yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> Hi, yeah, Jack. So, <laughs> So we're, we're really close to time and um, I just want to give a little bit of room for things as you've like been chatting through the process and taking us through your artistic history. Um, can you talk about how you feel about these works being in this exhibition called Extended Dimensions mm -hmm. and why it's important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I have a interesting relationship with, um, and not to say that this is like 
um, totally tethered to quilt making, but it's kind of like that expansive view of fiber arts, quilt making. Um, so I just see my work as um, more recently kind of referred to as gestural quilt making. And if you would think about gesture drawing where I am allowing the human hand through the sewing machine, but the process, the human hand to show that it isn't about total symmetry or perfection in, in sewing like tightly, like tight lines. It's really about letting kind of that human imperfection be a quality of the work. Um, so I think to be in this show, it, it's, I just want to be another representation of how we can push the, the boundaries of, of fiber arts, textile arts, quilt making, like all of that. And it's really exciting to see the other interpretations in the show too. Um, I am going to unmute. All right, thank you everyone so much for joining us here with the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. Uh, we were listening to Andrea Myers, phenomenal artist here in Columbus, share her journey and her work. Um, I hope you all have a great evening. We have lots more programming that I hope you'll tune in for. So. Keep watching us on Facebook and Instagram, and we have lots more for you to enjoy. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.